So, Paul, it's been a little bit harder than I would have thought, but we now have lots of information about the sun, how big it is, how much it weighs, its composition. energy store, its composition. But how does that come together to make us understand the sun as a celestial object? Well, so what does it mean to understand things and to an astronomer like us? What that means is we build a mental model, mm -hmm. or actually a computational model. Like I might have a model of your brain, like I think you're hungry and about to get and see if you don't get lunch or something <laughs> like this. This is my understanding of what's going on inside your brain. We can do a similar sort of thing. Where we have an understanding in our brain of what's happening inside the sun. We can't see the inside of the yep. sun, but we can come up with a, it's, it's too complicated for us to keep in our brain. So it'll be a mathematical model. It'll be a okay. bunch of equations or maybe it's done in a computer and it must be consistent with the laws of physics yep. and it must match all the observations. And it must, so if we can get a mental model that does all this, then we can be hopefully fairly confident that it's actually reality. Now, what if that reality is wrong, or what if that reality changes? What if our observations, our data, or our understanding change? Well, what we'd like to do is come up with a model and make sure it fits what we know about it, then test it okay. and find some more tests. And if, if our model keeps passing tests, we'll never be 100% sure it's true, because there could always be some new experiment yep. that happens tomorrow that disproves it. But if it's passed every test that's been thrown at it, and a lot of tests have been thrown at it, mm -hmm. We know at least it's useful. It's okay. probably getting close to the truth. This is the closest scientists ever get to the truth. Is a, I guess we, yeah, we, we can't create the sun. We can't become the sun. This is our we best. We can't even go in the middle and measure what's going on there. So this has to be our best description of what we think is going on. Famous quote is that um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. <laughs> so if our model fits all the data, and particularly if it fits data that hadn't even been dreamt of when we first came up with the model, yep. and there's lots of data, um, and it fits in with the laws of physics, then that's as good as we're ever going to get. It's not 100% proof, but it's getting pretty good. So how does this apply to the sun now? Okay, so our model, basically, we're going to have to know how the temperature varies inside the sun. We know the temperature at the surface, yep. 6,000 degrees roughly. How does it vary on the inside? Now, obviously, we can't see and sick a thermometer down there. No. We also, we know the average density of the sun. Yep which is you know, about 1.6 times that of water. It could be that the entire sun has that density, a little bit more than water, mm -hmm. or it could be the outer bits are lower density and the middle bits are higher, or the outer bits are higher or lower. So there's going to be some graph of density versus radius and some graph of temperature versus radius. And we've, we've talked about how the core probably has to be really dense to keep that hydrogen there. So there's yep. a few things along the way. So one thing we know, is we've got a number of constraints. So okay. a constraint is something that our model must pass if it's the bare muster. And so, the, so it must pass it because, in this case, it must match what we've observed. So the first constraint is that if we go back and look at our graph of density versus radius, yep. if we add up this much density times this much volume plus this much, it must come to the same to correct total mass. And if, obviously, if it's too much or too little, the model's wrong. Yes, because it might be a good model for some other star, but it's not a model for our sun. Okay. Um, we also need to have the density and temperature in the middle high enough to produce enough nuclear fusion to give the energy output we see. Now, how, again, how do we do that if we can't get to the core of the sun? Like, if, if the sun was all the same density, like 1.6 times that of water and all the same temperature, 6,000 degrees, there'd be no nuclear fusion. Yep. So that model definitely can't work. Okay, so, so at least we've excluded one. Yep. So it has to get much hotter and denser to force those protons together. Yep. And we actually know the physics of forcing protons together very well. So, so basically, if, if you have a bunch of gas at any particular temperature and density, we can work out using our understanding of nuclear physics how much fusion you get out of it. Okay. Now we know at the sort of temperature of about 100 million degrees and quite low densities, that's where fusion reactors work. Okay. Things like ITER, um, which has not been built yet, but other pre predecessors, yep. these are tokamaks where these magnetic fields convey the plasma. And we know they will generate power, fusion power, and they're at this sort of density and temperature. Yep. We also know a very, the reason why we know so much about this is it's useful for killing people. Yeah. And governments are always very interested in finding better ways of killing people. And they're prepared to put much more money into this than anything else. So this gives us a better understanding, actually, of our sun. And so H-bombs yep. are nuclear fusion. They use nuclear fission to generate enough heat and temperature to trigger nuclear fusion. That's right. And they are even hotter than the fusion reactors and at this sort of density, which is much higher, yeah. because the, the, the fission bomb concentrates the fusion until it gets to enormous density, allowing this to happen. So we have something that's a little bit cooler and a lot less dense, something that's a lot more dense and even a little bit hotter. The sun is cooler than an H-bomb, yep. even in the middle, uh, but more dense. 
So we have to realize, and it has to fit, and at least when we get with our data, compared to a, a bomb and nuclear fusion. Well, basically what we can do is we can say for any pocket of the sun, we can look at it where it is in this diagram, yep. and then we can calculate how much fusion energy it's going to generate. Okay. And there must be enough regions in the sun with enough density and temperature to produce what we see, but not too many. So the total right. power output must match observation. So, so if we add up all of those areas and how much energy and power that creates, we can't get enough more area than what we're actually measuring from the outside of that power. Yes. So if all of the sun was incredibly hot and incredibly dense, they'd be producing far more power than we see. All right. Okay. So that ends up being a really good constraint here, is that that limits how much can happen on the inside. That's right.